Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, energy seminar. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Joe Hicken from Sublime Systems. Uh, two tie-ins. One, you may remember our speaker a long time ago, two weeks ago at the beginning of the quarter, who had been a serial clean tech entrepreneur who mentioned one of the companies he worked at called Brimstone. Um, and he, in that discussion, also mentioned Sublime and much to my surprise, being a competitor, he said nothing but good things and actually gave a little uh, spontaneous promo for this seminar that, uh, that Joe is about to give. Uh, the other tie-in is how we find out, found out about Sublime is I'm the uh, faculty person in the capstone project for the MB MBA and JD joint EIPER environment and resources program. And we had a very uh, energetic young student named Corey Waltrip last, uh, I think it was last fall, yeah. last fall, who had done an internship with Joe's company and now is back there and actually did his project on market expansion around the globe for Sublime. So, Corey, if you're dialing in, uh, uh, welcome and thanks for the uh, invitation. I think this will be a very interesting uh, uh, seminar, we were uh, comparing Canary Media hype stories, and <laughs> at least twice in the last six months, uh, Sublime has been the center of a uh, very positive set of uh, reviews from, from Canary Media. So, Joe, thanks for joining us today, and we're really uh, uh, delighted to have you here. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Well, hey, um, everyone here in the room, and I, I know that folks are tuning in online as well. Uh, thanks for having me in. Uh, my name is Joe Haken. I'm Vice President of Business Development and Policy at an MIT spin-out called Sublime Systems. Um, so what I, the, the agenda that I want to kind of go through today is I want to um, talk a little bit about why cement decarbonization matters. Many of you already know that, but it's a good kind of level setter about why a company like ours exists and many others in this space exists. I want to introduce you to um, our solution to the problem, um, the people, the, the process, and the product behind what it is that, uh, um, that Sublime Systems does. Um, I want to kind of pop this out and have a conversation with you all about uh, bringing innovations to market, so a little bit of a product agnostic view on, on that, um, and then dive into why hard to abate sectors are hard to decarbonize, because um, it's not just about the technology. Um, it's also about adoption and, and supply chains and the complexities uh, associated uh, therein. Um, I want to talk about the public sector because in concrete decarbonization, uh, the, the public sector sponsors about half of the concrete that's deployed every year. And so uh, unlike other markets, they're a major driving force um, and have, have a role to play. Um, I want to talk about policy inspiration. So uh, how do we go even quicker on, on decarbonizing this critical sector? Um, and then, and then uh, conclude with a, with a little a few thoughts on adding value to all the stakers, stakeholders involved in, in adoption across the board. And of course, there's uh, 10 minutes at the end for, for questions and answers. So I look forward to that as well. Um, so before I get into this, I just want to, I'm going to throw the slide up here because I'm going to prep you for a question. I'm going to come back to the slide in just a moment. Um, but, but yeah, before we talk about cement, I want you to um, answer this question in your mind and then I'll go out to you in just a moment. Um, but have you purchased a Vision Pro yet, and why or why not? Um, so we'll revisit this in just a moment. Um, okay, so cement. Uh, why does cement decarbonization matter? Uh, it's because it contributes about 8% of the globe's CO2 globally, its manufacturer. So to size and scope that, what does it mean? About the same as all passenger vehicles on planet Earth combined um, is about the same uh, CO2 footprint as, as the manufacturer of cement. So there's 4 billion tons of cement uh, manufactured every year across the globe, which translates to very roughly, uh, it's not exact, but very roughly 4 gigatons of CO2 from, from, from the manufacture of cement. And this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon, right? And so uh, a number of forecasts are, uh, you know, uh, tell us that, that, uh, that the emissions from the sector will increase um, on, uh, by you know up to 50% or so under the status quo today. Um, so it's, it's a space that, that needs a solution. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the science behind it. But the cement manufacturer, about 90% about, uh, of the uh, emissions come from two major primary steps. The heating of the, the football field sized 
uh, uh, furnace or kiln um, to these exceedingly high temperatures, about the temperature of hot lava as it exits the Earth's crust, are the temperatures needed to calcine uh, cement. Um, and then the other emission source is from the raw materials themselves. So the breakdown of calcium carbonate um, and calcium oxide uh, essentially is for every, for every pound of limestone or kilogram of limestone that goes into a manufacturing process, about half of that actually decomposes into CO2. So, so the raw material itself actually has CO2 uh, embedded in it that, that, uh, that, that off-gasses during the manufacture. So my talk focuses on sublime systems technology. Um, but I conclude at the very end uh, with, with a nod to the other solutions in the space uh, that, that we collaborate on policy-related matters. Um, but sublime systems uh, innovation is a ambient temperature process, so we're bypassing the kiln completely in the manufacture of, of the cement. Um, our process avoids carbon capture, so the focus is on not emitting CO2 in the first place as opposed to emitting it and, and dealing with it or accounting for it through some other creative uh, technological or accounting mechanism, um, and with an emphasis on the material being designed to be a drop-in replacement for today's, today's cement, and that really does matter, and I'll talk a lot more about why that matters later on. Um, and the whole company was founded um, because uh, it, uh, the techno-economics tell us that we can do this with cost parity at scale, at steady-state scale, um, and that the, that the process itself and the feedstocks are scalable globally, right? And so uh, the feedstocks that we use are, are more abundant on, on the Earth's crust than limestone. Um, and those are key considerations, right, uh, to, to even begin this sort of venture. Um, OK, so, so talked a little bit about the problem space, talked about our solution. So this is our product in the space. It is a, a true zero um, uh, manufacturing approach, right? And again, what does that mean? It means that we're not. Um, we're not emitting CO2 uh, during the manufacture of, of the cement itself. We have a completely different manufacturing process that results in material that meets uh, industry accepted standards. And that's really critical, especially in the built environment, right, is uh, delivering a material that, that meets existing codes and meets existing standards um, so that you're not running up against, uh, you know, um, that whole side of, of, uh, of, of the adoption curve. Um, and then last, last but not least, when we think about innovating in decarbonization, uh, cost factors into this a great deal. Um, and so we would, the other sort of mature uh, you know, uh, alternatives are carbon capture, which essentially doubles the capex and can increase the, the opex by 2 to 4x. Um, or sorry, the, 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 co the cogs uh, by 2 to 4x. LPC? Oh, uh, ordinary, ordinary Portland cement. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. OPC is the ordinary Portland cement is the name for for the cement. the vast majority of cement that's used in all of our infrastructure. Thank you for that. Yeah, please call me out if I'm using jargon um, or more jargon. I do tend to use jargon. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, let's talk about bringing this product to the marketplace. So, so we've already talked about. The, the manufacturing process of cement itself, right, the emission sources come from the limestone and from that kiln, right? But as much as it hurts me to say this, no one really cares about cement. People care about concrete. And concrete is that final product, um, calcium silicate hydrate is the, is the fancy term for it, or CSH. Um, it's the material that builds our, literally our, our entire built environment. Uh, you can see concrete there on the walls. Um, and it's that hardened phase uh, that, that we rely on for all of our infrastructure. And so at the beginning of the, you know, of the journey is the manufacture of the powder itself, the cement powder, which then uh, is, is delivered to the customer and stored in large silos uh, mixed in, with, with sand, gravel, other admixtures, chemical additives, and water and turns into this perishable uh, liquid state, um, which is the fresh concrete. It goes in the, the famous concrete trucks delivered to the job site, um, where it then cures and turns into what we use today. Um, and so what Sublime Systems uh, is, tr is trying to do is delivering a product into that value chain that doesn't require the end user to do anything differently, um, delivering a a, uh, a powdered material that can integrate into the existing mix designs or formulas that these ready-mix concrete producers 
um, deliver to their customers, um, not requiring them to uh, to, to, um, uh, to even even think about uh, the, the the product that they're that they're using. Um, our, you know, what we're doing is we're using uh, renewable uh, electricity, um, an electrolytic reactor to extract our calcium, um, our lime, and reactive silica in separate streams, um, uh, and we use non-carbonate feedstock um, to extract our, our target uh, minerals. We reblend those and deliver them to the customer in, in a, a fine powder, a hydraulic cement that, that meets, again, the, the um, performance standards for, for this material on the market. Um, and then, and then when it hydrates, it results in the same calcium silicate hydrate, the same concrete that that builds our our built environment. Really briefly, the people right behind Sublime Systems. Sublime was founded by uh, Professor Yetming Cheng and Dr. Leah Ellis, two electrochemists uh, by training, who uh, were on the hunt for applying uh, the, the the first principles of electrochemistry to um, another climate challenge. Um, and so they founded Sublime Systems, spun out of MIT. Um, in, in 2020 um, and have subsequently attracted a number of uh, you know, leaders in research and development, um, scale-up engineering as well as, uh, as, well as in business and, and project development. And the company itself, right, it's not just about the technology but also the, the support that we've got uh, kind of uh, behind us. So we're funded by uh, the preeminent uh, investors in the space, lower carbon capital, the engine, um, uh, strategic investors, as well as um, the, the Department of Energy. We started off with ARPA-E grants, which then have, have graduated into uh, very significant investments. Uh, we were selected for an $87 million investment for our industrial demonstrations uh, plant, a commercial scale facility. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so getting back to this question. Uh, who, has anyone bought a Vision Pro yet? An audience. No. All right. Why not? Why have you not purchased one yet? Yes. The upfront capital cost is too much. It's too expensive, right? What is it? It's thirty-five hundred bucks for a set. Is that right? Yeah. So the the cost is prohibitive. What else? I don't think I might use it that much. You don't. Yeah. The utility. You don't know what the utility is of the product. It's not. It's not clear to you yet how you would use it. What's the value for 3,500 bucks? You could just get um, six laptops and place them throughout your house. Sure. What else? Is it just cost and utility? Well, some of the reviews are that, that it's actually kind of uncomfortable for more than about 15 or 20 minutes when you wear it. So, uh, so, so user experience uh, is there's a point of friction. It's actually it's uncomfortable. So it's actually causing you additional friction to adoption. Yep. Oh, it looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the aesthetics are not pleasing, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're wearing this big thing on your face. Uh, people might look at you a little differently. Um, aesthetics do matter a great deal. Yeah. Anything else? Any other reasons why I haven't? Uh, the technology upgrades so fast, I'm afraid it's going to out of date pretty soon. Uh, so interesting. So you, you've invested in the first iteration of the technology, and it will be uh, yeah. You, you've invested in a, a product that will be um, obsolete in in short order. Oh, that's a good one. It doesn't apply directly to cement and concrete. I like that one though. That's, that's a good one. Um, excellent. So um, okay, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, what are some points of friction when you think of low carbon cement adoption? What are uh, some things that might stop? The market from adopting this material. Is this really a drop-in replacement? Is yeah, the question is it a functional replacement, right? That's sort of uncertainty associated with the with the material performance, the product. Yep. The cost is it more expensive than normal? Similar, right? The same idea of cost, right? Is it a, is is or they're going to have to shell out thirty five hundred dollars for this uh, for this cement? Well, just like experience with the new cement product, like there's you know hundreds of years of experience with the old cement product. Why change? Yeah, uh, similar to you know the, the comfort, right? We we know that the the old stuff works. Why am I going to wear this uh, uncomfortable you know headset on my head? Or the many reasons why that would cause friction. If it breaks, then I'm not going to get any contracts with building manufacturers again. So. 
Yeah, yeah, the risk. Yeah, the, the risk, risk of adopting yourself, who your customers are, right? Your reputational risk associated with failure. Absolutely. Just structural integrity. Like, do you know if it stands up to the same, you know, tried and true product that you've been using before? Absolutely. Yeah, like the 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 compressive strength. What are the performance characteristics of the product itself? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, counterparty risk. You know, small company. Are they going to be here next year and ten years from now? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. The 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 the, the um, how confident are you that this will f will uh, be your supplier for future construction? Right, absolutely. Right, you don't want to you don't want to build in a <clears throat> a supplier who then just is going to evaporate at some point down the road. Absolutely. Disruption of purchase. My experience, look at when concrete don't behave the same on the construction site. Like you don't need not have the same uh, drying time the same uh, casting place uh, process and you can work around, you can make it work, but by experience the construction people they don't like uh, any disruption of this kind. Absolutely, so that you've actually hit a really important point and this one is very subjective which is what are the fresh properties of the material, right? Not just the hardened properties, does it, does it withstand the same compressive strength, is it just as durable, but like does the end user need to do anything differently when placing the material and interacting with it? Yeah, very much so. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. So, so our company has invested a great deal in, in a number of the considerations that, that you all have identified. So uh, how does the material perform with, relative to compressive strength? How durable is the material? And does it perform with the fresh properties such that we don't require the user to do something differently, to handle the material differently? Um, I won't talk through all of the, the, the content on the slide. It's a little bit of like one of those, uh, you know, uh, brain damage slides, as my boss says. Um, but basically, uh, we, do this, we do this at um, cement scale. We do this at concrete scale. And we measure both the hardened properties and the fresh properties. So when it comes to cement, um, there's basically two relevant standards to be uh, uh, thinking about. One is the definition. It's actually a chemically prescriptive definition for ordinary Portland cement, um, tricalcium silicate. Dicalcium silicate is a very specific crystalline structure that's prescribed um, and, and, and uh, characterized. It has its own uh, performance uh, uh, requirements in the definition. And then there's a separate performance-based definition um, which is slightly more stringent than the, than the performance requirements for the vast majority of cement on the market today. Um, and the key takeaway is, is that our material meets this, this requirement, ASTM C1157, which is slightly more stringent than, than today's uh, cement uh, um, standards or cement requirements. So we meet the, the performance-based requirement for the cement powder alone um, as, it, as the ASTM standards stipulate. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about like the durability, not just about the compressive strength and the cement alone, but how does the cement perform when mixed with uh, you know, the, the gravel and the rocks, the aggregates and the admixtures and the water? How does it perform in, in that context? There's a litany of very prescriptive tests that evaluate durability of, of concrete. Um, and we have a best-in-class concrete lab. We study for the test that we know that we're going to take. We want to know that we're going to pass that test before we ship a material to a third-party lab or, or a partner um, in, in, the, in the market. Um, and so uh, there's uh, exposures to sulfates, uh, alkali silica reactivity, chloride permeability, um, all of the sort of uh, corrosive uh, exposures that concrete can be exposed to, um, and measuring that in a controlled environment, how does it perform? And uh, suffice it to say, we perform exceptionally well uh, relative to these, these, uh, these, these tests. But then don't take our word for it, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, you should always question a startup's claims about its own product and its own product uh, performance, et cetera. And so third-party verification or validation is so key uh, to the space. So um, it, can someone else replicate uh, the, the cement compliance to the, the, the performance standard? having a third party evaluate our own claims associated with the environmental attributes of the product, having a third party uh, conduct a life cycle assessment on the product itself, um, and having third parties evaluate the material for safety, safety data sheet. Does, does the powder itself, you know, does it need any sort of different 
PPE for handling uh, in the real world. Um, and suffice it to say, right, we, third parties have validated that it is just, a, it's, it passes the standard um, that we have this clear path to these uh, significant reductions um, and that the material is safe to handle. It doesn't require the, the end user to do anything differently. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about, actually, where are we right now? I've got 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so field testing. So we've done our internal lab testing. We've done our third-party lab testing. But labs are, only take you so far, and the, this industry is, is risk-averse for very good reason. Nobody wants to be the next builder of a bridge that collapses, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a major uh, you know, bad day, I think. Um, and so, uh, so the industry is, is averse, uh, not just because of the compressive strength or durability, but fresh properties. Does the, is, the, is the material going to cause their workers more heartburn, work longer hours, uh, is going to mess with construction schedules? Does it cure the same, et cetera? Um, and so our company invested a great deal um, deploying the materials with a ready-mix concrete producer um, whose own customers are asking them for lower embodied carbon um, concrete. And so their incentives are aligned here to, to have access to uh, the latest and greatest as, as it relates to uh, cement manufacturing. And so we went through a, a four-phase kind of testing uh, um, uh, schedule. So one was putting the materials through their own lab, right, uh, before it gets onto the field. Doing, uh, you know, finishing trials to make sure that the, the concrete finishes with the same um, aesthetic uh, that, that, um, that today's concrete finishes with. Uh, then integrating it into the concrete truck uh, to make sure that um, we don't see uh, a performance uh, delta in, in that uh, kinetic uh, mixing environment. Um, and then lastly, pouring the material in the real world. Um, does the material pump, you know, does it load into the hopper the same way that, that concrete made with regular cement loads? And does it pump uh, to the job site um, the same way? Um, so uh, with the, with the um, lab testing, uh, what we did was they took what uh, their recipe is called a mixed design. Um, which has uh, regular uh, Portland cement and then also reactive silicates um, in it, so slags or, or fly ash. So we replaced their control recipe with our cement, and then we compressed, uh, compared compressive strength uh, through time. Um, and after 28 days, you see that, our, that concrete made their recipe using our cement resulted in a more uh, uh, a cylinder that, that failed at a much higher PSI than, than the control. And so what you're seeing is, at, in their lab testing, a, a stronger uh, concrete that actually could qualify, but the next step up in terms of um, how it's characterized. So 4,000 PSI mix uh, resulted in a 5,000 PSI uh, concrete. OK, so moving on from the lab, how did the material finish? Uh, this is somewhat subjective, but uh, had, a, had a, a concrete finisher. This person has been doing this for many decades, right? And this is troweling the material out. And uh, you know, concrete uh, can get too sticky. Uh, it can be uh, it, it can be unworkable. It can you know, result in a finish that's ugly. Um, and we got a veteran finisher to say, "Hey, this it's the same levers that they use to kind of adjust the flow and finish of of a concrete was available to this finisher, and it resulted in a in a kind of a." Uh, an eight out of ten. This is good concrete uh, made with this this material. Um, and then on to the you know the the the, the, the final series of integration tests, uh, integrating with the truck trial batch. So pouring our, our cement into the truck, spinning it, uh, and, and transport uh, simulating transport in the urban environment, driving around for ninety minutes, and then pouring the material, out, measuring the slump, like the, how how does the concrete flow. Um, will it will it fit in the formwork just fine, like today's concrete? Um, and then lastly was that field uh, trial, like pumping it through 250 feet of hose uh, and dropping it as part of a foundation uh, in the real world. And user experience through all of that, right? The fresh properties are are critical. Uh, it, it's it can't just be about like the compressive strength or the durability. It's you know does the existing um, construction and deployment infrastructure 
integrate with your product or vice versa rather um, is is a key thing to consider in terms of uh, adoption of of a, of a new product in the space. Um, cool. So let's talk about. Um, so we invested all this time and energy in the product, um, and and hard to abate sectors are hard. I think uh, you mentioned um, surety of supply is, is such a key aspect to adoption. And for us, right, we have today a pilot plant in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, that can produce up to 250 tons of cement per year. We got there pretty quickly. The company uh, spun out, as I mentioned, in 2020. And then the pilot plant turned on in late 2022. Um, and we've been producing cement for market validation and testing. Um, 250 tons of cement is, is a remarkable feat in terms of speed for a startup. Um, but commercially relevant volumes of material are in the, measured in the tens of thousands of tons scale. Um, at minimum, that's kind of table stakes for any one of these ready-made concrete uh, producers. So for us, the name of the game is getting to scale uh, at, a, at, a, at a volume that's relevant for commercial partners to build real infrastructure. Um, and so our first commercial facility, we, we announced uh, that we've got a, the site selected in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, it's going to be the home of our 30,000 uh, per year, uh, 30,000 ton per year uh, uh, commercial facility. It's not quite the full, uh, full scale version of this. The full scale version will be a million tons per year. But um, we just unlocked this, this funding, uh, which will essentially allow us to, to produce enough material to, to dispense with uh, remaining questions in terms of deployability and applications. Um, and then seeding the market for the full-scale manufacturing of, of, of what we do. Um, so moving on sort of more contextually. Um, so, so we've got this extraordinary manufacturing uh, um, process. And we've got some really great people that are not only scaling up this core technology, we've got a bunch of people focused on R&D making it even better. Um, but, but the, the market or the kind of the environment that we're entering is so very complex and it's, it's, um, it's not just about sublime systems and it's not just about our, 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 our product. It's about shaping the marketplace to be more receptive to low embodied carbon, uh, cement and construction materials across the board. Um, and so our, our uh, thought leaders at the Department of Energy have invested a great deal of time and energy into evaluating what are those hurdles to adoption um, across a number of hard to abate sectors, not just cement and concrete. Uh, but they published a, uh, a series of reports, they call them the liftoff reports, where they assess all the points of friction associated with actually successfully decarbonizing any one of these industries. Um, and so this, uh, you know, I, I point to this report because it identifies, you know, the procurement points of friction, um, the, uh, the, the capital stack formation, right? These, these new factories that manufacture uh, this material are, are large and, and expensive, um, and it requires, you know, creative uh, capital formation to get these things lifted off is how they characterize it. Um, and so in that regard, policy uh, and you know, f federal, state, and local policies associated with um, you know, uh, new technologies matter uh, an incredible amount. And so we look, to, we look to what are some policies that, um, uh, that contributed to the success of other uh, um, uh, technologies like wind and solar. And so uh, Canary Media recently uh, published you know, an article you know, with great news, right, that, that the vast majority of new energy generation and storage was, uh, was clean, was uh, renewable. Um, and, and the question that we ask ourselves is, how do we get there? How do we get there where we get this headline in 2024, and what was the path to unlock that? And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different contributing factors, including but not limited to, like, the technology itself improving and becoming cheaper. But what happened between the point of conception to the point where we are today, and uh, fundamentally the levers that were used, right, were power purchase agreements that are essentially reducing that merchant risk um, before the, the, the power was generated, having customers lined up to offtake the, the, the green electricity 
developing novel market mechanisms, uh, renewable energy credits, um, to access that product when you're not geographically proximal to the, the, um, the clean electricity. Production tax credits, the 1992 Energy Act, essentially uh, reduced from at the point of production, which is important from unit economics, um, that, that, the, that the production itself was, was cheaper and, and at parity with the, production, with the tax credit, right? Um, reducing the risk for investment to, uh, to say, yes, this is a good bet for, to, to build this out. Um, and, then, and then lastly, um, uh, and I'm ending just a little bit early, so we'll have more time for Q&A. Um, th this idea that, that the, the technological innovation might be singular. It might be, uh, it might be one company's sort of contribution to uh, decarbonization. But the reality is, is that, that policy and, and adoption is a collective activity. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that if Sublime Systems was the sole company uh, trying to decarbonize cement and concrete, we would be kind of out there on our own. Uh, running at a very hard problem. That's kind of a little bit ridiculous for one single entity to run at. But uh, there's a number of companies that are, that are attacking this through different um, strategies. So a company I like to talk about, they're uh, Minus Materials. They're manufacturing a synthetic limestone, uh, sequestering uh, CO2 and manufacturing limestone that they, then can be a carbon negative feedstock to uh, go into the traditional cement manufacturing process, essentially eliminating the emissions from uh, the limestone itself, that part of the equation. Um, uh, so we've, we've banded together on policy advocacy. We have a, an industry association called the Decarbonized Cement and Concrete Alliance. Um, it's, it's comprised of, of you know, our company, uh, Forterra, who is based out of San Jose, and have the, they just announced their first uh, demo facility in Redding, California, Brimstone, um, Terra CO2, they manufacture uh, synthetic uh, supplementary cementation materials so, um, so they can kind of create the same uh, concrete with a, with a, and displacing the amount of, of Portland cement in the, in the mix design. Um, carbon built, they manufacture uh, concrete masonry units and collectively uh, all of our companies spread throughout the United States are more effective in advocating for policies that, that um, support uh, domestic manufacturing, d more domestic jobs, um, and ultimately, right, uh, the U.S. is a net importer of cement. Uh, we consume about 120 million tons of cement per year, uh, and uh, about 20 to 30 million tons of that is imported from, from overseas. And so there's this, there's this alignment between U.S.-based companies in, in, in attracting um, policies that allow, uh, you know, U.S. innovation to flourish. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, we already talked about a little bit about the adoption from the construction supply chain. It's very complex, right? You've got your, you've got your owners who own the actual building and the facility. Um, you've got the, you know, the, the general contractor who does the, you know, coordinating all of the complex pieces that build the actual thing. Um, you've got the, the concrete contractor who, who uh, handles the material. Uh, you've got the ready-mix concrete producer and making sure that you're delivering value to each one of the players in that value chain. So, cre uh, so key to, you know, collective uh, adoption. And then lastly, I'll conclude with uh, a thought on community benefits plans. Um, so so uh, Sublime Systems uh, applied for support with the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. This is a new office that was established by the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm sorry, uh, by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and then the funding was dramatically increased with the Inflation Reduction Act. And this office was designed to uh, help with this valley of death, right? The, the pre-full-scale commercial, uh, first of a kind, and TRL-6 sort of pilot scale, like that industrial demonstration in between. Um, and as part of that, the, the policies required uh, applicants to develop a robust community benefits plan. And the idea behind that was that 
we've got this great technology. It has a great potential to, to reduce or, or combat the climate crisis. But is it possible for us to do multiple things at the same time? And I think this is a kind of a really interesting policy and something to pay attention to is basically the, this idea of can you drive economic benefits to very specific census tracts in communities that have uh, you know, either socioeconomic or other environmental um, ex, you know, cumulative exposure burdens that are, that are greater than other communities? Um, is there a way to partner with uh, labor in a way to provide high quality and safe jobs um, while also transitioning uh, to, to clean energy manufacturing at the same time? Um, you know, we, we submitted an application that had a very robust community benefits plan as part of it, really invested in engaging and understanding our future neighbors as part of that. Um, but I think uh, when we think about successful collective action, it's delivering value there too. Uh, so not just beyond like the immediate customer, but there are there other stakeholders that might otherwise be anxious about, you know, a factory being built nearby. Um, and it, can you do that? Can you deliver value to them as well? Um, and I think the answer uh, certainly can be yes. Um, and so with that, I, I wrap up uh, the, the presentation. Would love your questions. Uh, great, thanks, Joe. That was terrific. Uh, do we have any questions? Students first. See a few here in the front. Why don't we just, just go maybe this way? Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your feedstock? Uh, what's your raw material? Yeah, so we use. Uh, yeah, I, I won't characterize the specific uh, rock that we use, but basically rock rich in calcium and silica. Um, so there's a whole, uh, I'm not the geologist for the company, but there's a whole category of... of so does uh, that email any other guys? Say that again? Does that email any other guys? Other guys? Like, like you're avoiding CO2, but does some other guys come out of it? Oh, other gas, I see what you're saying. Um, n no, there's no other... So, yeah, in our feedstock selection, there are rocks that are rich in calcium and silica and are also uh, have carbonates. Uh, um, but no, our feedstock selection is specifically non-carbonate rock with calcium and silica in it. Okay. And maybe your question, maybe more broadly, is do we have other externalities associated with this? Um, and the answer to this is functionally no other than noise, and we are manufacturing uh, cement powder, and so controlling fugitive dust is an important aspect of, of siting, but uh, those are mitigatable. Over here, then over there. So, yeah, a couple of questions. So the first one is, how do you, how do you scale, so to, to uh, let's say, a full-scale full, full scale industrial plant? How much does it cost, and how can you overcome this big capex? I imagine that's a lot of challenge. And the second thing, I've seen you raise a Series A of forty million dollars. I imagine it's not at all sufficient to do that. And the second question is more broadly: so your plan is to produce one million um, tons of, of concrete per year. Then, I mean, the production is four four billion a year. So how do you imagine the next steps to tackle this on a massive scale? Yeah. So uh, reading back the questions I heard was capital formation for the first of a kind plant, the first full scale plant, and then following that question is. One million ton relative to four billion. <laughs> um, yes, there's a lot of zeros associated with that. Yeah, so so these are. This is why the sector is hard to beat. So today's cement industry, right? The concrete industry. I think uh, it, concrete is the is the second most used uh, material on planet Earth, besides water, uh, by humans. Um, so uh, so the scale of the challenge is mind boggling. Um, and so getting to your first question, that capital stack formation is a hard one. And the, the Department of Energy liftoff report identifies this, that no greenfield cement plant in the United States has been built with project finance. They've all been built off of the balance sheet from the existing incumbents who have invested decades, if not centuries, of resources into building their infrastructure. Um, and so, and so this, is, this is the core of getting creative with multiple stacked uh, financial investors in building these plants. Um, and so we've got a number of interesting conversations in flight associated with that, but that's, a, that's core to success and scaling. And then your second question, which is, um, what about the rest of the manufacturing? And the reality, right, is, is that these kilns do have a life, uh, like an end of life. And so uh, in, in geographies like the continent of Africa or in India, where there's not a lot of uh, uh, 
domestic cement manufacturing. Um, our vision is to, to be the technology of first deployment in those, lo those geographies and then in area working with the incumbents and being the technology provider as, they, as their kins, kilns reach their end of life or their quarries reach their end of life, um, exploring being the supplier of, of the technology for their, you know, their replacement. So it will definitely be a journey. It's not going to be uh, uh, you know, single years or even you know, a couple years away. Let's go over there and then back over here. We got a few over here now. Go ahead. I saw you guys raised like eighty something million in funding from the U.S. government. What was the biggest mistakes you guys made during that process? Oh, uh, during the process of applying for the the federal funding. Um, that's a really good question. What mistakes did we make during applying for the federal funding? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think when you're going from zero to one, actually, so this is actually, maybe this is the way that I'll answer that question. Uh, and I just got, I was up in San Francisco talking to another uh, group, and, there's, and they said, you know, this was like a risky investment, right, to go after that money. Um, what if it didn't come through? And we, we decided to, to lean into the process of applying for that funding in with our, our fullest um, canon of capability, largely because it made us stronger as a company to answer a lot of questions that we might not have answered about ourselves for six to 12 to 18 months from now. Um, and so during that process, when you're going from zero to one in assembling like the full, you know, all the details behind your scale up plan, uh, there's some inefficiency that's baked into that and some soul searching and some questions that are bumpy that, that startups tend to avoid until they have to step through that process. And so maybe I'd characterize it as, uh, was that a mistake? Uh, no, but it wasn't the most pleasant experience either. Um, yeah, I'd have to do a little bit more thinking about where we erred on that. I'll have to have a better question on like specific errors associated with it though. Okay, the first one I saw was on the aisle here, sir. And then behind you and then across the Thank you for your thoughtful thought. Can you say a little bit about customers? Who, you know, any traction at all? Who are you thinking? What are you seeing? Yeah, so, so cement, so this is the complexity of, of deploying this material, is that cement, the, only, the singular customer of cement are the ready-mix concrete producers. So they're the ones that actually pay for the material coming from the cement plants or importing it from abroad from the terminals. They, they aren't necessarily the ones that are, avo that are valuing the, the carbon or environmental attribute associated with the material. So, so what we're seeing is in markets where the ready-mix folks, their customers are asking for them to deliver a low carbon uh, concrete, they're very eager to engage. Um, there are markets where that's not a, a consideration or factor what, whatsoever. And so what we're doing is we're engaging, um, we're engaging the ready-mix folks, uh, but we're also engaging the infrastructure owners to, on the pull side of the, of the equation, because that matters, right, is do, do the, do the ready-mix folks, are their customers wanting this material? And so, so we're investing in a, kind of a two-pronged strategy associated with that. That gives your question? Great. Straight back. Okay, um, I have two questions. So my first is, Looking forward five or ten years, how does the decarbonized cement actually change um, labor demand in the cement industry? Does it um, increase jobs or decrease? And then my second question is, um, not sure if you touched on this already, but is there any way to quantify how much carbon is actually being produced or saved? So reading this back, question is on uh, impact on labor and then... Um, Carbon accounting, or like, how does how does the embodied carbon of our manufacturing process? How do you actually know what your um, what your uh, carbon intensity actually is? Did I get that right? Yeah. So the first one, and this is actually such a this to the, the gentleman's question about customer adoption. Labor is an important question. Um, the material, right? The construction schedules are very sensitive, right? How quickly is the material set? How soon can you drive a truck onto the flat work? How soon can you strip the form work from, uh, from the cast-in-place structures? And so the answer to that is actually 
we want the material to perform the same so that there's no, there's no increased labor costs associated with construction, um, which is the uh, major cost driver for, for new builds. Um, and so our intent is actually to not affect the construction schedule. Uh, the, the question about other jobs associated with this, so in the US, our vision is that, hey, since we're importing 20 to 30 million tons, we can increase domestic uh, manufacturing capacity and increase domestic jobs, which is politically um, you know, a winner for uh, regardless of, of, of political um, affiliation. Um, so in that regard, but, but there's no, the number of employees necessary to run our full scale plant, uh, we don't think it's too much different than today's you know, cement plants, um, which actually don't require that many people um, to, to operate. And then your other question on the carbon uh, intensity, there are uh, methodologies uh, that are established to measure um, the, the global warming potential of a product. There's uh, environmental product declarations and product category rules that establish the, the, the way that you um, measure your, your global warming potential. Um, and that's actually, that's a key question asked though for all of the innovators in the space, which is, is it really lower carbon and how much? Um, and that's, that's a really important accountability measure for, for this sector uh, f for the years to come. Okay, uh, boy, now I have three or four more. I saw this one on, across the aisle there. Yeah. Let's see how many we can get in. Yeah, so I had a question going back to, um, not like in detail with like the geology of your feedstock or anything like that, but in terms of the actual like access, like um, you talked about, you know, when existing sources for traditional cement have run out, is that something you guys are concerned about? Like in general, is your feedstock as common as like, I think it's basically limestone, the like traditional cement uses, so is it that common, or is it like only found like underwater, or like under sea turtle nests, or like is it <laughs> some hidden costs associated with it, or is it pretty, it's just some type of rock that's also pretty In, in Wakanda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, actually, it's actually made of sea turtle shells, uh, is there a feedstock? Um, no, uh, that's, yes, the, the answer to your question is, um, uh, the, the, ge the geologists that we have consulting for us, and now I think we actually have a full-time uh, person who's doing a global GIS um, a canvassing of availability, and the answer to your question is, is it's, it's more abundant on Earth's crust than limestone. There are, it's actually really interesting in terms of feedstock, actually I, I'm gonna, we'll talk after, there's an interesting like rabbit hole on feedstocks, but the answer to your question is, is that it's, it's uh, available abundantly. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go here, here, and then two back in here. Ben. I have a question on current costs. So obviously for any new project, there is a cost curve, and eventually it will reach OPC-style costs, hopefully. Uh, how far is Sublime at right now in orders of magnitude, uh, and what would be the key levers which would bring down those costs, barring capital costs? We're not, yes, capital costs will be high. Um, and the other one is on the DOE funding, Sublime and Brimstone both were funded by the Department of Energy. There was an order of magnitude difference. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so, uh, so we, okay, so our technical economic model tells us that, that at steady state scale, right, we can deliver this at cost parity with today's Portland cement, which is between 120 and $180 per ton. It's actually very cheap, the, the cement is surprisingly cheap. Um, the way that I'm going to answer your question is this first uh, commercial plant in Holyoke, Massachusetts, it's a 30,000 ton facility, it's going to employ between 70 and 90 people, um, pretty close to the number of employees that will employ out of the million ton scale plant. So if you think about like the economies of scale, there certainly is this, uh, we call it a scaling premium with delivering the product to, to market. Um, and we call it scaling premium because it's, it's not a permanent feature of the product, it does go away. Um, as we get to that mass production. Um, so that's how I'll answer that one. And this, the second question was the delta between brimstone and, and sublime. Uh, I think the way that, the way that I, I, I said this to my boss, Leah, I said, um, I, I'm just happy we have less to raise on the other 50% cost share. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, here, then there, and there. Good. So if I'm not mistaken, um, the cement industry is very regionalized because of the high transportation costs. How are you dealing with that? 
Yeah, so, so cement uh, is distributed in a reasonable radius around the site of production, unless there's water transport, uh, in which case it, it is barged uh, um, in these large barges. Um, and so, yeah, at, when we think about having a, uh, being effective in deploying the technology, it's actually being a technologies provider um, to folks who have built these complex logistics um, machines. Here and then back up here. Good. I got two questions. The first, can you remember us your number in terms of uh, decarbonation? Like, what is, uh, is it like a 50% reduction, a 90, whatever? And the second is, uh, if you are like above 50%, what, what are you waiting for to move to Europe? Where you don't need to, you don't need to convince the, your customers, like, they are buying and building whatever capacity they can to do that. Well, yeah, so uh, what I'd say is if you have any friends in Europe that want to, uh, you know, scale up manufacturing, let me know. Um, yes, so we've partnered with Climate Earth to do an independent LCA, right? You don't get an EPD until you, you know, have a commercial plant. Um, but they've done an LCA in our process that says that we can uh, get to 93% or so decarbonized relative to today's Portland cement. So massive reductions in, in the, sea, uh, the carbon intensity. So I was half joking when I said like, what are you waiting for Europe? Because like, uh, I think it was like six months ago, I attended a, a conference of the uh, European General Contract Association. Basically, uh, they don't have a plan beyond 2035 to meet uh, their uh, reduction standard because like, in lab uh, solution, don't go uh, beyond fifty to sixty percent, uh, and so it's like, okay, what do we do next? They have zero plan. So you go there, you tell them, yeah, we have a ninety percent reduction. Like I, I kid you not, like uh, general contractor, yeah, the ETS. kind of investment to build the capacities. No, the ETS is is a perfect instrument, right? The incentives are there. So in a matter of time, it becomes more and more costly to produce uh, cement using the status quo process. Um, and we've engaged with the, uh, the commission. Uh, oh, they, they were recently uh, revising the definition of clinker uh, for, the, for the ETS. Um, so we've, we've been engaged there for sure. And that's an exciting market, as is, as is Canada. Any place that has a, a price on carbon is, uh, is an interesting market. Last question here. Um, you mentioned in your kind of decarbonization strategy or why you're product is less of a carbon footprint compared to your competitors, um, that one of the main sources of that is using renewable energy. But often around the world, renewable energy isn't readily available. What does your carbon reduction look like when, say for example, you're not using renewable energy and instead just the proprietary mix um, that you described? Yeah, so so our answer to that is a couple fold. One, we'd, we'd need the grid to decarbonize across the board for all sorts of uh, decarbonization strategies. So. We have to collectively invest in that. But then secondly, per, per it, the, the application, the best marginal use of an electron is on the subline process in terms of its impact to decarbonization. So per dollar per electron, you're going to get the best value relative to all other applications of those green electrons. And that's kind of our, that's kind of our position. Great. With that said, uh, thanks, Joe, for what was obviously a very stimulating talk, given the number of the quality of all the questions. So thanks for the audience for those as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.